Okay, welcome everyone to Tradition Kitchens. I'm Julia. We're so excited to have Rosh of An Acquired Chef here to teach with us again. It's been a while, but she is uh, our regular chef in residence at Tradition Kitchens. So we love learning from her all the way from Australia. And she's going to teach us about her traditions and making batika cake. And uh, you can bake along with us or you can watch and, and make it later. We can't wait to see how people get creative in the kitchen with us. We'd love to know where people are joining us from. So if you'd like to put into the chat, please, uh, your city, state, country. We attract a global audience. So it's always really nice to have folks from around the world join us with Tradition Kitchens. Um, if anybody is brave and I see you on video, we love people on video because it feels like we're cooking together in the same kitchen and we invite people to introduce themselves. It looks like Leanne is joining us from Massachusetts, or excuse me, Lena. And Eve is from California. Eve, can I put you on the kitchen cam to say hello? And um, how did you find us today? Oh, and you're on mute, it looks like. Hello, I um, followed some of your cooking um, um, uh, presentations before, and I really loved them. And so I'm very much looking forward to this. I love Southeast Asian foods, so this is going to be great. Wonderful. We're so happy to have you. Thank you for coming. And, and Humboldt County is in Northern California. It's really close to Eureka. Great. And I love the waterfalls behind you. Those are beautiful. Oh, thank you. Um, that that's Hawaii. That's somewhere I used to live and took a picture of. Oh, it's gorgeous. I love it. Well, thanks for being nice. here. And we have Margaret from Boston, who's also here. You've been joining us regularly at our classes. So, for those of you who are new, Tradition Kitchens is a cultural cooking community. We're all about learning people's stories through their foods. And we feature guest chefs to, to cook and teach with us. Some of them are our neighbors. Some of them are more experienced and have their own bakeries or restaurants. We love learning from all different levels and everyone is welcome. I'm gonna put some links in here for uh, An Acquired Chef where Rosh teaches uh, and you can share um, and like and comment and enjoy a lot of her great, great work on social media. So I just put those links in. And then as part of this class, I'm going to put in, if you want to learn how to cut a square, um, line a square cake pan. She has an awesome YouTube demo for us. We're going to kick off now. I just want to give a quick plug uh, for those of you who are able to. We have made this a cooking for a cause class. So we are supporting World Central Kitchen as part of our special holiday giving back series. Uh, World Central Kitchen responds to people who experience food emergencies, whether it's a natural disaster or um, a conflict in the world. They are there um, and it's led by an incredible chef, Jose Andres. We've raised nearly $500 from our couple of classes. So I'll put the link in if you're comfortable. We have a community fundraiser so we can track our giving. And if you gave already, thank you, thank you. Or you can just give directly to the organization and, and let us know. Um, with that, Rush, over to you for our amazing class today. And I'll be monitoring the chat for questions and an exciting uh, evening, afternoon, but morning for you teaching from Australia. Thank you, Julia. Hi, everyone. And yes, it's morning over here for me. So uh, it's not even noon yet, and I'm already in the kitchen baking, which is always fun for me. Um, appreciate you guys joining. And I just want to echo Julia's uh, sentiment on World Central Kitchen. I think they do some really great work. And so if you guys, um, you know, I mean, one of the reasons I love doing free cooking classes is because we get to support causes. It's one of the reasons why I love working with Traditions Kitchen. So, you know, as a season of giving, think about being generous and helping those in need. Uh, certainly uh, think about uh, donating some 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 funds there. Now, um, ingredients for today, just real quick in terms of logistics, should be on the registration page that you would have uh, used to sign up for class. Um, I will be releasing it next week, I believe, on social media. So if you, if you prefer to see it later or in case you forget, you can always check that. But for now, if you want to follow along, and especially if you're cooking along, uh, the ingredients are there. So... With that, um, we are going to be doing a Goan 
uh, coconut syrup cake. Um, and, and this version is called Batika. Now it is, um, I just wanna to touch on the fact that this cake is, is, is almost from that entire region. So Egyptian version of the cake is called, and, and you'll forgive me if you're Egyptian or any of the nationalities I'm about to quote, but it's Basbusa. Um, uh, Lebanese call it Namura, and I'm treating it off here. So um, Turkish call it Sambali or Revani. Um, in India, it's called um, Suji cake. In Greece, it's called, uh, actually, yeah, in Greece, it's called Somali, uh, which is close to the way the Turkish call it. And then Persian love cake is the Iranian version. Suji cake in, in India, Batika in southern part of India. And then even in Malaysia, we have cake Suji. So this cake is, it's just synonymous to the region. And I just wanted to call that out because there are so many different ways to make this cake. And I think even if you were to go, for example, to Lebanon, they'll say Namura is made a different way in, in this province versus the other. So um, take, take that with a pinch of salt, make it the way you like it. Um, I've seen this cake made with and without syrup. I'll be doing it with syrup today. I've seen this cake make, made with and without eggs. I'm doing it without eggs. I'm actually doing a vegan version today just so that you know everyone who has all their dietary needs can swap out things. And I'll start with the base vegan version. And typically this is also made with semolina, which I believe in the US is called farina, uh, which is basically cream of wheat, which means it has gluten. So today's version is gonna be using polenta, which is I think called grits in the US. So it's just cornmeal, so no gluten in it. So lots of different substitutions that I've played around with. Um, and I love this cake for that reason, because I think it's just some, something that everyone can enjoy. Um, so yeah, they're just all those different kinds of cakes. And I've even got a Persian love cake recipe up on my social media. So if you wanted to check that out, that's actually made, that, that one's not vegan, but it's made with almond meal instead of cream of wheat, uh, semolina, or in today's version, we'll be doing polenta or cornmeal. So with that, we're gonna start by making the syrup first. Um, I'm gonna switch cameras and I'll also just mention, cause Julia's monitoring the chat. If you have any questions along the way, um, please ask them. I'll do my best to answer them either during or after class. Now I'm gonna, the, the way we're gonna make this cake is in a couple of different phases. We'll start with the syrup. Um, and that's actually a syrup you wanna make, you could even make a day in advance cause you do want the syrup cold when you pour it onto the cake. And I've actually already got syrup sitting in, in the fridge ready to go, but I'll show you how to make it. It's really simple. We'll start with that, then we'll move on to actually making the cake. So um, I'm just gonna switch on my camera and do some funky tech over here. <laughs> Bear with me a second and then we'll switch back to, to making the syrup. So here we go. Yes, perfect. So I'm gonna get the fire going on this guy and I'm gonna get a nice little pot. So, you know, anything that, you know, typically I think this is a milk pot and I'm gonna go in with a half a cup of water first. And I'm also gonna go in with half a tablespoon of lemon juice. I've already squeezed it out. And I've actually sieved it because I don't want any of the fibers in there. I want the syrup to be pretty, pretty clean. Um, actually, I think I'm going, yeah, I'm going in with half a tablespoon's worth of lemon juice. And then I'm just going to go in with the sugar. And that's a lot of sugar. So it's two parts sugar, one part water, and about a half a tablespoon's worth of lemon juice. That is just going to come to a complete boil. I do want the sugar to melt before I switch the heat off. And at the very end of it, I'm going to add rose water. Now, while that comes to a boil, I'll talk a little bit about rose water versus rose syrup. So ooh, is that upside down? Let me switch that around. <laughs> Bear with me a second. <laughs> um, hang on. It good to me. Oh, did it look good to you guys? That's not coming upside down to you? Oh, guys? yeah, upside down. It is, right? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> cool. Let me just quickly switch cameras so I can talk about it here. There we go. So um, so it's already starting to come to a little bit of a melt. So I'll drop that. So we've got rose water or rose essence. Hopefully you guys have seen some of this before. So rose essence more, is more concentrated and rose water is more diluted. So we're talking one pot rose water, four, um, sorry, four pots of rose essence will make one pot rose water. So a teaspoon equals a tablespoon. So depending on which one you have, you can either use a tablespoon of this guy or a quarter of a teaspoon of this guy. Now, Having said all that, I'm using a tablespoon of this because I love rosy flavor and, and I, I like putting it into uh, the cake because it really starts to pop when, um, when, when you put it in. So it's really up to you. I just wanted to call out the differences there. Um, some people say, you know, like I don't particularly like lavender and, and some people go, oh, you know, when you put too much lavender and stuff, it starts to taste like soap. So if you have that same sort of uh, affinity with rose, Go, go with the lesser amount, not the, the more amount so that you don't feel like you're eating a soapy cake. <laughs> but I just wanted to call that out. Now, we'll make sure that the sugar is completely dissolved. Hopefully you guys can see that again. 
And we don't want to add the rose water until after we switch off the fire because that can help. Uh, it'll, it'll actually make the rose water evaporate and we don't want that. We want to add it in at the very end. So we'll let that come up to a complete boil and we will make sure that all the sugar is dissolved and, and that's it. As soon as that, that comes up to a boil, it's ready to go. Um, but I think my fire is struggling today. We'll, we'll, we'll give it a minute and, and if it doesn't come to a boil, we'll switch. Um, but yeah, after that, we just want to sieve it. So I'm, I've already got my little jug and sieve, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, I, again, I like sieving the syrup so that it just kind of removes any impurities, any sugar that didn't dissolve and maybe got burned for whatever reason. It's just a nice little safety net, no pun intended. So, <laughs> um, but yes, throw some questions in if there are any, any at all. So far, I, I know it's pretty straightforward, so there shouldn't be, but just in case I thought I'd ask. Um, Rosh, oh, yeah. question for you. This cake yes. is such a part of so many different cultures and traditions. Mm -hmm. like yes. Why is, is that? I'm just curious. Or do you know? Well, I, I could guess. <laughs> I can tell you how it came to Malaysia, because uh, a lot of uh, Indian heritage came across to Malaysia uh, around the mid uh, mid the, the middle of the last century. I always forget if, if it's the 20th or 21st century. Um, so that's how it uh, came over to Malaysia. Um, how it came to um, uh, India was from Iran. So uh, the Persian, uh, the Mughal Empire came across, I'm just going to stop that, that's come to a boil now. So I'm just going to switch that off and make sure that the sugar is all completely dissolved. So the Mughal Empire came and um, uh, to India in, I believe the six, 1600s, 13 to 1600s, and they would have brought it with them. And how it reached Iran, I that's beyond me. I don't have the link there. But if it started in Egypt, or if it started somewhere in the Middle East, it would have spread throughout the region just because that was part of what people ate, I guess, and they just brought it with them. Because that's the beauty about this cake. It keeps for quite a while because it's drenched in syrup. And because this one's made with uh, polenta or cornmeal, it actually has a, a, sh a good shelf life. So that means it travels well, which means traders would have taken it with them wherever they went, which is probably why it kind of found its way all around um, the different parts of, of that region, my best guess. So <laughs> hopefully that answers the question. Um, but I'm going to switch cameras. Now back to where we had it before. Uh, hopefully you can see. So I've got my sieve ready to go. Um, and I'm going to pour it in. So it, it's a dark color. So you should see it come through golden. But I'm just going to pour it all the way. You can see how it's viscous compared to water because it's got lots of sugar in it. And it actually came out clean this time. So nothing in there. Uh, but I still like to do it just in case. That can now go into the freezer if you're, you know, you've got uh, le very little time between now and when you're going to use it to pour on top of the cake, or it can go into the fridge, or you can leave it at room temperature overnight. A little bit of that steam is going to come out, so it's going to thicken even more. And um, we basically want it cold because today's cake is going to be uh, coming straight out of the oven, and we want to put syrup on it. So if if you if you're putting syrup on a hot cake, you want the syrup rule of thumb to be very cold and vice versa. If you've got a cold cake, rule of thumb, you want the syrup to be really hot. So today's version is a hot cake and I'll explain why later that we want to pour it on the hot cake, but we want our syrup cold. So that's it for the syrup. Were there any questions on that while I start setting up for the next phase, <laughs> which will be to, to get our, um, our cake batter going? Yes. Rose um, Oh, go yeah. ahead. Minus go, no, no. Question. Oh, Rosabelle's wondering difference between polenta and cornmeal, if you can explain. Best I can tell, grits in the US is white. So polenta is yellow. So that'd be the difference. So that it's just a color difference. And just with the same with grits, there are different grades. So there's coarse and fine and things like that. For today's cake, we're using fine. So we don't want it to be coarse because we want it to be as close to semolina or farina, which is typically quite fine for this cake. So that's um, that's where uh, there'll be differences more so with regards to the, the texture and the color. But by, lar by large, it's kind of very similar. You know how some recipes will go, oh, if you're using almond uh, flour, uh, you can substitute that with regular flour. I would say the same to be true for polenta and grits. I would. I would easily, I've made tons of, tons and tons of cornbread with polenta uh, in Australia, because Australia just calls it polenta instead of grits. So if hopefully that, that starts on to the question, um, but tell me if it doesn't and we'll come back to it. I'm just gonna keep going into this bowl. I'm putting in a half a cup of sugar and that's just gonna go straight in. And that's granulated sugar 
You could use white if you like. I'm using brown because I like um, uh, that extra depth and caramelized flavor that uh, sugar, that darker sugar gives. I'm back on my um, little pan now. I've swapped out to a smaller pan because I'm going in with vegan butter. So this is basically just coconut sort of um, coconut butter mixed in with, I think, a couple of different oils, all of which are vegan. And again, that, that's my substitute for butter, regular butter today. So that's what I'm going in with. You could do this in a in the microwave 30 seconds at a time uh, to completely bring it down to melt. I'm just doing it on the stove top today because I have it handy and <laughs> you, can, you can see it melt. So it's a, as you can tell, it's white color butter because it's coconut oil, um, coconut oil or coconut butter. So you could easily use that as a substitute if you if you have that at home so that you know you don't have to go out and buy anything. But then there, I know that there's so many other different types of vegan butter. I would imagine any one of those would suit just fine. You just want it to make sure that it melts down uh, because we want to make sure that that sugar and that butter mixes well together before we put uh, the polenta in there. So there we go. <laughs> um, is there, so semolina is the typical, yes, correct. So uh, Roosevelt's semolina cream of wheat is traditionally what's used at least in, in Goa and in India to make this cake and also in, in Malaysia. As I mentioned, Persian love cake uses almond meal um, and, and other parts of the world use whichever grains available to them. But it's, it's just that cream of wheat um, or polenta, as, as you know, it's, it's kind of got that kind of a grain, which I'll show you in a second, which means it, it comes up quite crumbly in the cake. It's not like your regular sponge cake. And so it, it, it's good for absorbing syrup in that way. And it also is really light. So that's one of the reasons why um, I think they decided to use semolina in in the cake. Um, but it's the, in, in my last cooking class, if any of you had attended it, I made a, a sort of a breakfast dish called upma. It uses the exact same thing, that semolina or farina um, is what got used to, to make that dish. So that was a savory dish. This one is a sweet dish. So yeah, a bit of fun facts for you guys. So um, it's slowly boiling its way down. I'm just gonna let it completely melt and then I'll put it into the sugar that I've got going on over here. And then we will um, put in the polenta next. So I don't think we have anyone cooking along, do we, Julia? If we don't, that's fine. I just thought I'd check in case uh, there were, were any questions. I don't, I don't see any views of a kitchen, mm -hmm. um, but just maybe Andy might be. Uh, Andy asked me a question about, instead of using regular sugar, could you mm -hmm. use something called jaggery powder, which is made from a sugar cane. Mm. Yes, you could. Mm -hmm. Yes, you could. Um, I would just uh, lessen it a little bit in terms of the quantity going in. So maybe um, depending on if you want a very, very sweet cake, because jaggery is when you measure it by cup, it's quite compact. I mean, it weighs more. So depending on if you're weighing or if you are um, using a cup measure, you just want to adjust for that. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, otherwise, you'll get a very, very sweet cake, which if you're a sweet, you have a sweet tooth, actually, probably isn't a bad thing now, is it? <laughs> um, so let me know if that that all works for you. Uh, but if not, we can come back to that. That's all melted. So I'm going to go straight in with the coconut. Oop, I should do it that way so you can see it. Yep. Just almost looks like water, doesn't it? But yes, it is oil. <laughs> now that it's melted, it has the consistency of oil. And that's it. That's all done. I'm just gonna let it sit for a second and I'm just gonna mix it in. Now I am going to maybe move this guy out of the way so that I can use that. Um, it won't dissolve all the way was the point I was trying to make then. Um, it is just gonna be something that melts a little bit and starts to mix in a little bit, but that's about it. So um, yeah, it's just gonna kind of become a bit sludgy if anything else. And yeah, let me just make sure, yeah, that's nice. And front and center, there we go. So um, the next thing I'm gonna go in with is cornmeal. So I did say I would talk about polenta. So this is the fine version and it is yellow. So I can pull out grits and it'd be the exact same thing, except it'd be um, white. <laughs> so that's gonna go in next. And um, yeah, so that should be good. And I'm just gonna go in with that. I'm going to mix it in and it's going to become really sort of like a like a like butter and sugar mixed together basically it's actually 
very close to what it ends up looking like when you've uh, beaten butter and sugar together and it becomes really lumpy and grainy. Um, or if any of you have any other way of describing this, I'd be keen to hear, but that's what it reminds me of. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. A quick question. Sorry, what was that? Someone, yes. there's a lot of creative substitutors in this class. So <laughs> instead of using sugar, what are your yes. thoughts on stevia and adding a bit of molasses? Um, stevia is fine. Uh, I think with any artificial sweetener, um, you probably need to use less than the amount of sugar because it has that sweetness to it and it can come across as quite artificially sweet when you use the exact quantity. So most most stevia or sugar replacement or, uh, sweeteners have like um, a measuring. So it's like if you want one cup of sugar, use three quarter cups of stevia. So I'd follow that to make sure that you've got the same um, flavor coming out. Um, molasses, you could probably use if you wanted to, but you did say a tiny bit. So I'm not sure, were you thinking of adding it to the cake batter or to the, um, to, to the syrup? Maybe if you, if you add that. Yeah, feel free <laughs> um, to share if you're comfortable telling us about your creative culinary direction. Don't forget to unmute. And while they're finding the unmute button, I've mixed that up and that's that's ready to go in terms of it's it's ready for the next step. It's really, again, not gonna mix in very much more than that. I'm gonna go in with a can of coconut milk. Uh, that's a 400 ml can and it's milk, not cream. Um, I've shaken it up because most of the time when you have coconut milk in a can, it tends to separate the milk, the, the fat in the water. I am going in with all of that. So if you are using coconut cream, I would use um, probably three quarters cup of coconut cream and maybe add a little bit of water and, and uh, a little bit of coconut essence if you have it so that you get the same. You do want the liquid is, is where I'm going with because what, what we're about to do next, I'll quickly mix this up and show you what happens next and why we're using coconut milk. So that's it freshly mixed. And this is it sitting for about 30 minutes. So we're actually gonna leave that batter to sit for about 30 minutes or longer um, because it's gonna actually, much in the same way, when you cook grits, you have to put a lot of water in there because it's, it's a really thirsty ingredient. So we're gonna let all that coconut milk get absorbed into the grits or polenta. And, um, or even if it was semolina, you'd do this, or farina, you'd do the same thing. So many names, <laughs> hopefully no one's getting confused. And so we're gonna let that sit. I've let that sit for about almost an hour, but 30 minutes usually is plenty. Um, and so that's why we want coconut milk. Cause if you put coconut cream, it might be too thick and not watery enough that the polenta would be still quite, uh, have a bit of a bite to it. And that's not something we want in a cake. We want the cake to be nice and properly cooked and moist. So I'm gonna put this guy aside now, cause that, That'll be the cake that I make for later. Um, but this is 30 minutes later. and It's had a chance. You can see there's still some liquid there, which is what we want because we, we are gonna put some flour in there in a second. Uh, but yes, we do want most of that to go into the polenta first. So I'm gonna steal the spatula um, and bring it back here. So we're just gonna, so as you can see, it's really pulpy. And, and that's gonna be the rest of the cake. The cake's gonna be really, really thick and lumpy. Um, but for good reasons. <laughs> so I'm going in here with, um, I think it's half a cup of flour. So I've used gluten-free flour and I've used a yellow flour just to stay in theme. You do not have to use it. It's actually corn flour that I'm using, which is gluten-free. Um, and that's why I've, I've used that one. Um, and also going in with, so you could use white flour if you prefer, or if you were making with um, grits and you wanted to keep it white. I've got two teaspoons of baking powder and a quarter of a teaspoon of baking soda also going in. Very important to add that at the end, as opposed to before you put it into the polenta, because it's a raising agent. As soon as it touches water, it's going to have um, a reaction. And we don't want that reaction to happen until closer to when we're putting it into the oven. So... That's going to be so. That's going to be the the flour and the baking soda and the baking powder going in. I'm just going to go faster with a spoon. Uh, but yes, after this, all we've got to add is the um, desiccated co coconut, and then we're ready to start putting it into a cake pan. So, any questions? Other than the ones that have been great questions, by the way, I love them because it really tests my knowledge. So keep them coming. Um, I like uh, learning as well. So I've, I've learned a couple of things myself. So appreciate the questions. 
Have anyone ever had anything similar to this sort of a cake before? Um, or like, you know, something similar, something syrupy. Maybe it's, it, it'd be great to hear people's experiences with it. Go, go ahead and come off mute or either type into the chat box. We'll, we'll come back to you. But this is actually a traditional cake for uh, people in Goa around Christmas. So it's not a Christmas cake. They actually have a Goan Christmas cake. That's a different dish. But this is always on display during Christmas, Christmas time in Goa, um, which was a, a Portuguese uh, settlement for a little while. So um, I think Catholicism is, is pretty big in that, in that region as well, which is why Christmas is celebrated, even though it's in India. Yeah. So, yeah. I think I've Fun. had this before many years ago in a Mediterranean Egyptian restaurant on the dessert menu, and it was amazing. I know that Parul is here and her heritage is India, uh, from India. Have you ever had the, a version of this, if I could put you on the spot? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, I feel like I must have, but I don't have, you know, I don't really have much beyond you of this. Yeah, I've definitely had this flavor combination of um, coconut and rose in cake, but... You've I had suji think... cake though, haven't you, Paro? Yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah, this is like suji cake, but for, for Goa, basically. Suji right. cake's made with semolina and, and doesn't have egg in it usually in India. They call it rava cake sometimes. Right. So this is this is basically India's version of it mixed in with Portuguese and Goan influence. And, and yeah, that's it. Um, <laughs> so you've probably had a version of it. You just um, probably right. call something else. Sure. Yeah, amazing. Appreciate you coming up, um, being put on the spot, though. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. She's always our honorary culinary uh, expert. Joining <laughs> That's us. it, 100%. Anyone else? Eve or Margaret, um, Marie, Sharon, Kathy, Andy, Lena, feel free to let us know if you've tried it before, if you're going to make it maybe in the future. Yeah. Definitely do that. So as you can see, that cake batter is really lumpy. Like I said, it, it would continue to be that way. I was just pouring the rest of that coconut milk out of the tin. And the last thing that's going into this is desiccated coconut. Um, and, and that's it, the cake batter is ready. So it's really not very pretty in terms of like, you know how when you make cake sometimes like really smooth or like, especially when you make cheesecake, sometimes you have to run it through a sieve to make sure it's smooth because you don't want lumpy batter. Here, lumpy batter is the name of the game. That is actually what we want. I'm gonna mix this desiccated coconut in now, and it's literally gonna pull away from the bowl and kind of be able to like, almost like a dough hold itself. And that's really the, the consistency we want because um, that means it's ready to go into the cake pan. So it's, um, and, and just kind of on that though, it's really more just because it's a dry cake, uh, which is why we end up putting syrup in it. So we actually want that consistency. Um, I should have mentioned this at the start, uh, but I have the oven at, you, you'll translate this for me, Julia, because I don't know what, um, what it is in Fahrenheit, but it's at 195, oh, sorry, 190 Celsius, degrees Celsius. So uh, that's the temperature at which we will bake the cake. Uh, I have it at 100, yeah, 375, thank you. Yeah, so I, I put it. At, ask, a, go ahead. ask the internet for that answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Google is everybody's friend. Yeah, so um, I I put it at 380 or 390 as you're preheating it, and then um, and then once you actually put the cake in, you drop it to 375. It's a trick I have because every time you open the oven door, all that heat comes out. So if you put a higher uh, temperature, and this is for anything, for baking cakes, for for roasting, you put a higher temperature, it it holds the temperature even when you're opening it up to, to put something in or take it out. So yeah, so as I said, it pulls away like dough, but just it's not as, um, uh, as what's the word I'm looking for, as like held together as dough, if that makes sense, when you have dough at the right consistency, but it won't stick to the bowl. Um, it's got no water in it left. That's just really it. That's, that's what we're looking for in terms of the, the consistency of the batter. And so now we're ready to put it into um, into cake pans. I'm going to swap it around. Um, and so my cake pan looks like a robot at the moment, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, 
and I'm going to pull out the cake that I put in before the start of class because I have to I had to get that ready and I'll explain why again in a second because uh, so actually I'll explain now so from the time so we had from the time you make the syrup the syrup can be made the previous day that's great the cake you need to make with polenta or, or semolina having a chance to soak for at least 30 minutes before you can finish up the batter all of these things can be done in advance which makes this cake kind of less hectic if like you're in the kitchen and you have to do everything in one go. You can make the syrup and soak the polenta overnight if you want. Um, and then it's a matter of baking the cake. From the time you bake the cake and as soon as it comes out, you need to basically put the syrup on it. So we're gonna come back to these guys in a second. So I'm gonna jump ahead and pour the syrup on the cake while it's super hot and show you um, what it looks like. And then we'll finish making this part up if that's okay with everyone. Hopefully that's not too confusing. Um, uh, but yes, as soon as the cake comes out of the oven, we need to pour the syrup on top of it. Uh, and then we need to leave it for at least two hours or even overnight. I'm gonna run to the fridge to get the syrup. Uh, but yeah, so that's why I wanted to do it as soon as I pull it out of the oven. And it's one of those gradual things that take a bit of time to absorb because it's a cold syrup. That was a very noisy fridge. Uh, because it's a cold syrup, um, it needs some time to kind of just sit and absorb into the cake. So we'll, we'll jump around and keep things interesting. There we go, that's the cake ready to be pulled out. So it smells amazing. <laughs> um, but yes, you know let me pull it out, go ahead. I was thinking this cake actually reminds me when I look at it of like um, almond, the semol semolina looks like almond flour a bit. A um, little bit, yes. It looks cool. Is there a way to make it with that instead or would it totally change the flavor? Uh, with almond flour, let me think, um, you, you could, I don't see why not, but it's just that it doesn't behave the same way. So it might have a different result. Um, I'm just going to pour the syrup while I talk. So that's just the syrup that's been sitting in the fridge. As you can see, it's a little bit thick, um, but to, to actually, sorry, I need to take a cake tester and just poke a bunch of holes all over it first. This is pretty much with any syrup cake you do. I'll come back to how I've sort of scored the cake and, and those are actually cranberries. So bear with me. But yes, um, I'm just gonna poke a bunch of holes around it. And you, as you can see, like this cake didn't rise a lot. It, it really is, um, the baking powder and the baking soda was more for just making sure that the cake raises a little bit because it's a very dense cake and that gives it the perfect setting for putting syrup on top of it. Um, and and that syrup is going to take a little while to absorb. So I'm just going to help it along with the holes. But to your question, um, Julia, almond meal behaves differently. Almond, meals behave, almond meal behaves more like flour and less like grits or farina, or uh, semolina or polenta, however you, however you refer to it. That stuff's like a grain and it's very, very dry. It's very, very, very thirsty grain, whereas wheat isn't so thirsty. So if you used almond meal, which behaves more like flour, you, you might end up with a very watery batter which may not cook properly so my point there is you probably need to adjust other other ingredients if you want to use almond flour then i'd suggest and i can share the link for it uh you can make per persian love cake that's better suited and also has a syrup in it uh similar syrup actually the syrup's pretty much the same the cake's different um so i could probably share that if, if any anyone wants to use almond meal i would recommend using that recipe instead because that's actually adjusted for almond meal Whereas this one's adjusted for either farina or again, all, all the four things, farina or semolina or polenta or um, uh, now I've lost the fourth one. Uh, I can't remember it. <laughs> polenta, for, polenta is uh, cornmeal, grits, that's what it is. Um, so yeah, so as you can see, I'm hopefully that answers the question, first of all, Julia, before I jump off that. Yes, that's great. And now the syrup is mesmerizing to see it. <laughs> going. Yeah, it, there's a little bit of patience involved uh, because the cake's hot, so you want to pour it on top, but you do want to give it a chance to absorb. If you pour all of it too quickly, because this the cake pan I'm using is bottomless, or the, the sorry, it's not bottomless, the base is removable. So if you pour too much of it all at once, it'll overflow and all your syrup will be on your countertop, which we don't want. So you do need to kind of have a bit of patience and just allow it to slowly absorb. You do want to throw all of it in. So I'm probably about halfway through and I might pause for a second and then continue in a little bit. But if I was using hot syrup right now, 
the steam from the cake and the steam from the syrup would be fighting with each other and the syrup would not get absorbed. Whereas here, because it's a hot cake and it's cold syrup, it's going in quite, quite well. And similarly, if it was um, a cold cake and a cold syrup, then the syrup's just gonna slide off the cake because cold and cold doesn't work um, when it comes to syrups on a cake. Um, and then the other thing I did, uh, which I'll try to show you in a second, is I scored the cake because this cake is really quite dense. So when you cut it, um, it's easier to cut it when you've already scored it. Otherwise, it just becomes quite crumbly. So that's the reason I scored it. And I'll show you how to do that in a second. Um, but other than that, I put cranberries because I actually made this for a Thanksgiving dinner the other day. And I'm like, I need, I need something that's Thanksgiving themed when I take this. And I decided to put cranberries because cranberries is, are quite sour, sweet, but sour. So they, they, they serve as a nice little contrast to, to the cake itself. And so I thought that went really well. Some people put other kinds of dried fruit, not just on top of the cake, but into the batter. You're more than welcome to do that. Doesn't change the cake at all. Just makes it bigger because it's got more stuff in there. And it will make some of the uh, syrup uh, kind of, it'll, the absorption will happen around the fruit instead of into the fruit, because obviously it's got sugar in it already and is quite dense. Um, yeah, so... Uh, so you could do that, uh, but I put it on top so that, you know, how some people, like I do particularly don't like raisins, so I can just pull that off the top and know that the rest of the cake doesn't have it. So in case anyone doesn't like it, it makes it easy for them to eat. So there, that's the cake. It's it's still pretty hot and the syrup's on it. We're going to leave it on and in, in the tin for about at least two hours, if not longer, and all that syrup will disappear. So we just really wanna give it a chance to like sponge it all up before we take it out of the cake pan. Um, and by then it's nice and sort of moist and all enveloped and beautiful. And then you can start to slice it up and serve it. So this is the type of cake that I'd make the day before it's served um, because then it has a chance to really sit in, 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 the, in the fridge or um, wherever it is uh, that you leave it to soak. I would leave it at room temperature to soak until it comes to room temperature, then you're more than welcome to put it in the fridge if you want. If you are serving it the next day, I would leave it at room temperature because it becomes quite dense when you put it in the fridge. So if I was serving it for dinner today and I've made this cake yesterday and I put it in the fridge overnight, I take it out and put it at, uh, on, on the countertop throughout the day to come to room temperature before serving it. Or you could warm it up if you wanna, if you wanna do that as well. So yeah, there you go. So that syrup's all sort of almost all the way absorbed. Some of it's kind of just sitting around. So I'm just gonna leave it. But that's the cake done and we're going in reverse, like I said. Um, these little clips I had put in place to just hold the baking paper together. So I don't need them anymore. So I'll pop them off and you can take a look at that later. I'm not gonna be able to take this out today to show you. So I'm gonna quickly show you a cake that I've already made. So that's what it's like once you cut it up and you can put it on a, on a plate. Um, and then of course, because it's got rose um, essence in it, you can put some rose petals on it and even put rose syrup on it. But I'll do that later when I show it to you right before we finish class. I just thought I'd quickly show that to you guys. That That's the cake. It kind of cuts up into square and, and looks pretty. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so that, that's the cake. I'm going to put this to the side now and switch back to what I was doing before, if that's all right with everyone. And I'll come back for him later. Were there any questions on any of that? Is that pretty straightforward um, so far? Or maybe yeah. I confused someone. <laughs> I think people are nodding that they're following. Perfect. The and mesmerized Fabulous. by the final product. It's like, it looks delicious. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to go back to the future and actually I'll show you how, how to put the batter in, into, the, um, into the pan and, um, and then we'll, we'll score it up and, and get it ready to go. So as I mentioned, it's, it's really sort of quite a crumbly batter and you'd be like, oh, that doesn't look like it's been cooked. Yeah, it's, 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 it's good to go. It's exactly what we need for this particular cake because we want it to be like a really dry sponge. So I'm gonna put all the batter in first. Um, actually, I might do it um, gradually. So I'll mix it around. What I wanna do is basically have, make it so that I'm pushing it down like that and giving it a chance to kind of layer on top of, otherwise I end up with a lot of batter that I need to kind of smush to the edges like I'm doing right now. So if I do it gradually, then it becomes something that um, doesn't need to be smushed too much towards the end. So it's really like, um, like, you know, it feels like when you're playing with sand at the beach 
and there's water and it turns into that kind of texture. That's really what it feels like. And you just really kind of want to keep going at it that way. Um, really important to bake this at 375 or 190. I baked this by accident at 180. And what happened was all the desiccated coconut fell to the bottom and all the, the polenta or, or semolina went to the top. And then it was this really weird cake that couldn't absorb the syrup. And so make sure you, you keep it at 100 and 190 or 375 if you're doing Fahrenheit when you bake the cake. That's really, really important. Um, and as you'll see, I'll show you this before, like before and after. And you'll see that the cake actually doesn't rise too much. It is really quite um, a dense cake. And as I mentioned before, the, the, the baking powder and baking soda is more to create air pockets inside the cake so that it absorbs the syrup rather than for it to actually rise the way a normal cake would. It's a lot of baking science, um, which I like. I, I find that stuff to be quite fascinating. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go in with the rest and then we'll finish up with scoring. And we're good. And I'm just gonna use the spatula to just scrape off. Perfect. Now I'm just gonna, again, spread it all around and kind of keep going in circles until I have it. The thing I do at the end um, is I just grab, and I'll show you, I'll grab a baking, a sheet of baking paper or parchment paper, and I'll just, as best I can, try to even it out uh, using that because it's hard to do with a spatula. Some people usually have a cake plate that's slightly smaller than the size of the cake pan. You could use that to, to even it out uh, as well, just to kind of get an even layer on top if, if, if you like that. I know some people are quite particular about that. They wanna make sure the cake kind of looks really, really pretty. If you don't care, that's totally fine. It doesn't change the cake. It just becomes a crumbly texture. Uh, so, so long as you score the cake, then that takes care of it so that it doesn't kind of fall apart. Cause it's like a big, it's like a big soft cookie, basically, is, is the cake texture before you put the syrup in it, which is also another reason why we keep it in the cake pan before we actually, um, before we put, like while we pour the syrup on it so that it actually um, has the chance to soak up the syrup. So I'm just gonna go grab some baking paper. Just the baking paper like that, it's on top. And you're really just using that. You know, I'm not going <laughs> to compete with that noise here. Let me just do that real quick. All right. So you just kind of want to go in the way you would a cake and just make sure you hit all the edges so that um, it's even. Doesn't have to be perfect. Um, you can use the plate, like I said, if you want it to be you're more than welcome to. But yeah, you just wanted to make sure that it's all sort of evened out and that's pretty good for me. <laughs> you can go in on the corners and smush them down a bit more if you want. Um, no, it wasn't greased, Kathy. Sorry, I'm oh. just looking at the chat box. Yeah, it's not greased. It, um, or maybe it's, I know we call it baking paper and parchment paper and some, there's a slight difference between them. In this case, there's enough oil in the cake that if you used anything, it, either it'd be fine, but there's no grease on it. I just tore it off the roll and, and sort of went at it on top of the cake. And I think it got some of the, the um, vegan butter that's in the cake batter. Um, you're talking about the paper lining inside the cake pan. I just read that comment. It hadn't scrolled all the way down. Uh, you can use it. Um, I've used it because it just pulls out easily. You don't have to because it doesn't change the cake. It's more about cleaning up. So if you prefer no sticky burnt bits inside the pan, which you shouldn't have if you've lined the cake pan properly. Um, and you can watch that video on YouTube that I did. Um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have it, but if you worry about that, then the grease will help with, with cleanup. Um, but the cake pan that I just showed you, um, the one that came out of the oven before, I didn't put any in. So it, it'll still come out because it's a cake pan with a removable base. So you shouldn't have any uh, trouble trying to pull the cake out. You'll just lift it out with a cup at the bottom. So perfect. Now, um, what was I going to do? Oh, I was going to score the cake. There we go. So I've put these little paper clips because I've measured it with a, a ruler because I like making sure I've done scoring before and it's been like, like a really bad puzzle. And um, I don't like that personally. So what I do is I just measure it out and I've done, I've just, this is like a 20, I think this is an eight inch pan. So they're two inches a piece um, and on, on both sides. So I've just done that. 
um, and measured it out so that I can do something like this. So for example, if I just go between this clip and this clip, I know that if I pull, put the, the ruler like that, um, then I can just kind of go, yep, that's, that's gonna be a straight line. That looks pretty good. Now I can just score it that way and kind of just keep going down until I see a clear line. And whoop, has to go down a little bit more in the middle. That's it. Perfect, so that, that's one scoring. So I can do it again. Yeah, that is the middle. <laughs> I'm like making sure it's the middle. So now I'll do it on this side and so on and so forth in that fashion. So I might actually do it from the other side um, because I have, I'm right-handed. So, um, yep, yeah, so again, right there. Now there's so many different ways. I know any, any mums or uh, uh, nanas on the call, they, they probably do this with their eyes closed because they have made so many cakes in, in their time. Um, but I'm not as practiced as some of them are. So I like to do it this way. If my mom was watching me right now, she's actually not on the call today, but if she was watching me right now, she'd be like, you're doing, you're making it way too complicated, Rosh. Just, just use a knife. <laughs> so again, I'm just showing this for those who are quite particular and, and don't know how to do it. Um, this is how I normally would, uh, but you're more than welcome to skip this or um, just use a knife and just kind of run Run some lines down so long as they're equal parts and you will be just fine. Whoop. There we go. Um, any questions on any of this? Because I think it's pretty straightforward, but you know, some people sometimes do have clarifying questions that maybe I've skipped some parts. Whoop. Just do um, I don't think you've done this question yet, but is it best to pat it down so the end result is firmer and less crumbly? from Rosabelle? Yeah, um, uh, ultimately this is a crumbly cake. So as much as you can push it down to allow it to bake evenly is, is perfect. And then the rest of it, the syrup will, will absorb into, but you don't wanna leave it like in a lumpy batter like we did at the start of, of the, um, at the start of the putting it into the pan when it was just kind of a, a heap. You do wanna push it down to make sure that it's all compacted in there. Um, but yeah, hopefully that, answers the question, cranberries. I'm just gonna go in randomly, and this is something fun for kids to do, but yeah, just kind of put one in anywhere and the cake will literally, and I'll show it to you again, come out, you'll, it'll just be a slightly different color because it would have cooked for about 30 minutes in the oven, um, but it is roughly the same um, size. Now this cake pan's eight inches or seven inches. I think that one's eight inches. So that one's gonna look slightly wider, but other than that, it's probably uh, the same. And you could use either depending on whichever cake pan you have at home. I know some people will be like, oh, I don't have the right measure. And some cakes you do need it because certain cakes, if you if they're too wide, then the cake collapses down in the middle. And if they're too, if it's too narrow, then the, the cake rises up too high and it cracks. Like this cake, you won't have that issue uh, because it doesn't really rise at all. So you can use whichever cake. You can even use a round cake pan if you prefer, um, roughly the size that I mentioned. If you use something too small, it will rise, obviously, because it does have baking powder. But by and large, if you follow the measurements, roughly plus minus should be fine. So yeah, that's it. They're ready to go into the oven. And this is it outside of the oven, slightly different color. Maybe I'll do it this way so you can see it. But yeah, slightly different color because it's been baked and has syrup in it. This one hasn't been baked. Um, and you probably can tell the depth, but this guy's come up just a, like a couple of millimeters or like a quarter even an eighth of an inch, it's risen up. Uh, whereas this one's just a bit flatter. So yeah, that's the cake. Um, there we go. <laughs> um, is it best to start room temperature? How long will these keep? Yep. So as I mentioned, if you're gonna serve it today or the next day, keep it at room temperature. Cause even if you store it in the fridge, you need to take it out and let it come to room temperature before you serve it, unless you wanna nuke it in the microwave. Um, I can, I'd say keep it into the fridge up to a week, not more than that. If you wanna keep it for longer than that, you'd need to start freezing it uh, so that it has a chance to, to have a bit more shelf life. And if you freeze it, it'll last at least three months, if not more, um, probably even up to six months, depending um, on, on when you freeze it. So if you freeze it straight out of the oven, up to six months, if you freeze it after keeping it in the fridge for a week, probably closer to three months. So yeah, hopefully that answers that question, Rosewell. but it is something that changes when you put it in the fridge. So um, you wanna make sure you take it out and 
I have the right camera there. You want to make sure you take it out and, and leave it to, to come to room temperature naturally instead of forcing it with, with the microwave. So with that, this is the cake that you would have. Um, and what I mentioned before was rose petals. These are edible rose petals, also used for rose tea. You can always sprinkle those around. You can even add some more cranberries if you want to the cake, just so that people have, if they like cranberries, they can grab a couple more cranberries. And then if you really, really like rose, because I do, you can pour some rose syrup on top and it'll start to drizzle down and look pretty amazing. So there you go. Batika or Goan coconut syrup cake. That's the rose syrup that I use, by the way, in case anyone's wondering, it's just a bottle of rose syrup. But yeah, there we have it. It's amazing. I'm gonna finish off the rest of those cranberries here because I can. <laughs> there you go. A very photogenic cake. Isn't it? I love the, the way the rose syrup sort of drizzled off, but yeah. Any final questions for Rosh? Um, confirming you take the clips off before baking. That was just for the sheet pan. Oh, you can leave them on. I mean, these, these are metallic uh, clips. So hopefully you can see that. But they're the same kind of paper clips you use, um, like you get it in the stationery store. You can leave them on. Uh, you don't want to be, if they're plas made of plastic, then you definitely want to take them off. But I actually like keeping these in the kitchen because they're always good. Sometimes when you put cake, um, a parchment paper and stuff, and it just doesn't want to stay. Um, I find just clipping it on helps. And I always have these in the kitchen for that. So yeah, a little bit of a baking or, or um, yeah, actually a baking hack for everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Marie. Appreciate it. Thanks, Sharon. Um, yeah. If there weren't any other questions, um, I'm happy to, to pass back to you, Julia. Um, but yeah, that, that's the cake. Uh, just stop my screen share. Um, yeah. And um, Give it a try. I always enjoy seeing people's renditions of what I make. I know Marie, you always send some through and I always feature you on social media. So if any one of you wanna, wanna give it a go, not just this, but any of the recipes that I share, please um, send them through or uh, more importantly, if you have questions on any of them, I'm always happy to answer them and, and get creative with sub substitutions and things like that, so. We really appreciate you and you sharing your culinary traditions with us. Thank you, Rosh. Round of applause. Lots of uh, thanks happening in the chat. Feel free to thank you. Share your favorite emoji as well. Yeah. Um, Go and for it. I put in the chat and I'll put it in and you'll get an email with the recording as well as the step by step directions in the next week or so. So you can follow along both ways. Also, um, just a reminder, we hope and appreciate all gifts to World Central Kitchen. And lastly, we have another sweet class tomorrow. We're doing uh, crepes. So Allison will be teaching and um, Allison is a physician by day and a crepe lover by all other hours. So look forward to having you. I see that iPhone has raised their hand. Do you have a question? No, maybe might have been an accidental yeah. putting myself on mute, but raise my hand all at the same time. Um, click. <laughs> exactly. Well, this is crepes. Mm -hmm. The crepes class sounds amazing. I'm excited for that. Um, I know you did, you guys did a latkes class, if I'm saying that correctly. Hopefully, I am. Um, I think last week that that was incredible. Um, yeah, keep keep them coming, Julia. We love it. We, yes, latkes is actually next week. Um, oh, it's next week. Okay, yes. I've mixed them up. <laughs> that's okay. No, there's so so many. We're doing a lot for the holidays. So we'll send everyone the dates and the times. And thank you again, Rosh, for sharing your tradition with us. Um, My pleasure. And thank you everyone for being here. Have a great day, evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. <laughs> Fabulous. See you all soon. And don't forget Well Central Kitchen. They do great work, so do support them. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thanks, Rush. It was a great class. Thanks, Parl. Thank you. Pablo. See you guys. Bye. <laughs> Bye.